at Southampton, a new liner has made her appearance, dwarfing smaller vessels and the dockside buildings. She is Windsor Castle, flagship of the Union Castle fleet and much the largest liner ever to sail regularly on the South Africa run. Soon she will sail on her maiden voyage to Cape Town and on board the finishing touches are being added in preparation for the great day. The thousand and one minor jobs that must be done before she's ready to cross the vastness of the ocean. Below, the last screw is tightened and the final touch of paint is added. With telephones in many of the cabins and air conditioning throughout the passenger accommodation, this is a liner that caters for the traveler of the 1960s and nothing has been neglected to ensure his physical comfort as well as his internal well-being. The lounges are elegant and carefully planned to give a feeling of space and luxury. The birds in this decorative cage won't fly away. They are fashioned of delicate Venetian glass. Should you feel like a dip, there's no need to jump over the side. There are two swimming pools on board. Or perhaps you prefer a glass of something cool in the veranda cafe. The tourist smoke room is a striking public room conceived by Michael Inchbold. It's nautical in flavor in case you should forget that you're at sea and the rotunda has a central stove in the form of a telescope pointed at the night sky represented on the domed ceiling. The youngsters also are not neglected. If the captain won't let young Willie steer the ship, at least he'll be able to satisfy his desire in the playroom where the saucy Sioux lies firmly at anchor. The accent on this liner is of grace and the dining room artistically designed achieves this. A private dining room fit for a stately home is available for private functions where good food and good wine keep good company. In the wine cellar, many fine wines are stored under ideally controlled conditions and the champagne for that special occasion. Dirty linen must be washed, not in public, but in the ship's laundry. The rotary dryer saves putting up a clothesline on deck. Ironing and pressing are a part of the preparation going on behind the scenes, for there will be many passengers to look after during the voyage. Getting the ship ready entails a lot of work, and plenty of people on board with hearty appetites keep the cooks hard at it. While she's in harbor, steam for galley services and heating and for maneuvering is supplied by a Babcock auxiliary boiler. The mighty power needed to drive the liner through the seas comes from three Babcock main boilers, enabling her to cruise at 23 knots. And she has enough power and speed in hand to cut two days off the present 13 and a half day voyage. The main control desk and panel, the first of its kind to be installed in a luxury liner, brings together vital information about the boilers, turbines, and other equipment keeping the ship's engineers fully aware of operating conditions. So, on a grey Thursday at a little before four o'clock, Windsor Castle sails down Southampton water on her maiden voyage southwards across the equator to the Cape. Her 800 passengers looking forward to 13 days of graceful living. Built by Camel Laird with a gross tonnage of 38,000 tons and a cargo capacity of well over half a million cubic feet, she is the largest liner ever built on Merseyside and a fine tribute to British craftsmanship and enterprise. Every working day between 5.15 and 5.30, the Renfrew factory empties. 6,000 men from the works and 1,000 staff from the offices pour out into the streets. Yet, a quarter of an hour later, there's hardly a soul about. It's the daily miracle. Miracle, my foot. Don't think it's I been like this, because it hasn't. I can remember not so long ago, we had to hang about in the cold, queuing for trams and buses at the top of the road. After a day's work, when you want to get home to a fire and your tea, this can be the last straw. 
Oh, but it's true, things have changed. Partly the war, I suppose, and partly signs of the times. New ideas, new ways for working folk all over the country. Oh, they look after you better nowadays, all right. Uh, it's a very different story now. Take a chap like me. Me and the wife decided to take a house out in one of these new estates, away from all the grit and dirt. But what's the good if you can't get to work without a lot of sweat? And how would we do that without special buses? Since the war, a whole system of buses has been worked out to enable people to get to and from work with the least possible trouble. Well over 2,000 men and women from the works at Renfrew now rely entirely on these services, which pick them up from inaccessible spots such as Priest Hill and Craigie Lee, or congested places like St. Enoch Square, and take them back at night. as Renfrew Ferry, where so many folk from other works are milling around at the same time. And take the trains, for instance. There's a station right on the doorstep. Three specials run down from St. Tears in the morning and another up to carry away the night shift. A train in the evening coincides with the work's exit. And there's also the familiar and friendly figure of Mr. Graham, the station master, to see that everything goes all right. There's no doubt about that popularity, as you can see. Nineteen trams come in here in the morning. It's one of my jobs to see everything goes to plan, and this corner's only a bit of it. I was glad when the extension was made. It saved me one of my biggest headaches. In the old days when that tram had to stop on the main road, there was a jam up every day. No traffic get by, people were all over the place, and no joke either, especially if the rain's coming down. Then, soon after the war, Bob Cox and the corporation got together to get an extension down Porterfield Road. Costs were shared and Bob Cox put down two-thirds of the money, I'm told. Now it's possible for up to 20 trams to be marshaled on the side and to cope with the rush. Ah, everything goes quite smoothly now. Many improvements come about through the action of the Workers' Transport Committee, which includes representatives from the shops, and regularly discusses any problems or grievances. For instance, here's Sandy with a complaint. Something about a tram that's been held up a couple of mornings running and made him and his mates late for work. Will Joe see if he can get the committee to do something about it? And Joe's as good as his word. Mr. Carmichael, who is secretary of the committee, promises to ask the corporation for an explanation. A letter goes out the same day. The tram people look into the matter on the spot at the depot. The explanation is found, and the corporation's letter read to the committee at its next meeting. The committee knows that with the backing of the management and the confidence entrusted in it by the men, it can put a case that compels attention. Miracle indeed. It's not a miracle then, but a lot of hard work and goodwill on everybody's part. Management, the transport companies, the transport committee, and us fellows out at the works. There's an efficient, speedy and cheap means of getting to and from the works. Everyone knows that attention is given to grievances or suggestions through the committee. 
and the missus knows just when to pop the supper in the oven. But here, just a minute, who said there was no such thing as miracles? In June 1954, the SS Clan Robertson, the latest of a proud line all built in the Clyde, completed its trials on the measured mile in the Firth. The fact that this 7,750-ton vessel, like so many vessels of the Clan line, is equipped with Babcock's marine boilers, is a tribute to that good performance and reliability. At almost the same time at Govan, in the George V dock, lay the Clan MacLeod, just off to South Africa. The largest single item of her cargo was this fusion-welded drum made at Renfrew, destined for the new power station at Tybos, near Johannesburg. At Moog... Here, leaving a Glasgow bank is more money than any of us will ever earn in our lives. In these bags are one week's wages for employees of the Renfrew Works. The men and women in the works earn their wages in a variety of ways. Some are skilled, others unskilled. Some earn by the hour, others by the piece. Some are paid for their individual efforts, others for team production. Whatever the method, each man has his wage card. Donald Gatons is a machinist on piecework. When a job is finished, his foreman gives him a work slip. This he takes along to the timekeeper. The timekeeper then marks up the wage card at the rate fixed for the job. At the end of the week, the wage cards are collected and taken to the Hollerith department. Using the information from the wage cards, girls punch the special Hollerith cards. These are then fed into the ingenious sorting machines and in a few hours of rapid addition, multiplication and division, the machines digest all the necessary figures to produce the weekly payroll. These machines also detail how many coins of each denomination, from half crowns to coppers, will be required from the bank. A letter is then written asking the bank to pay out of the company's funds the impressive sum of money needed for over 7,000 wage packets. And so, back to the bank from where, under the watchful eye of the police and with strict security precautions, the cash is taken to the works. Every wage earner in the works is given a wage slip, which tells him how much he will draw on payday, and is used as a counterfoil to see that he gets the right money. Friday morning in the wages department is the climax of the week's work. Teams helped by sorting machines work at top speed to have the wage packets ready in time.
completed packets are placed in dispatch boxes, one for every section and department in the works. And a few minutes before payout, the procession starts off. A few minutes later, workmen all over the factory, Donald Gaitens among them, are receiving their pay. It all goes so smoothly that few people realize what a triumph of organization is needed, week in, week out, to complete Operation Payday.